This morning, we are in uh, Sunday number two, looking at our uh, series called Revealed. And it's one thing believing that Jesus came to this world to give us salvation, which is true, by the way. But there's a bigger picture involved with that. He also came to reveal the Father to us, not just to buy our salvation, but to give us salvation, not just to buy eternal life for us, but to deliver eternal life. And in that sense, eternal life is living with the Father. And we do that every day. And so Jesus said this, I, uh, when he was praying, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me in the world. And that was his plan, was to reveal God to us so that we could know him and experience eternal life. And, and it's important because we aren't moved by what we don't see. Now, if you go out on the back deck at night and someone is out there admiring the sky looking up, you might think, oh, they're enjoying the scenery. They're enjoying the planets and the stars or, or uh, maybe the northern lights. And you say, what are you thinking of? And they might say something like, do you know that the whole world is filled with radio waves and microwaves and VHF and UHF waves and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and all kinds of currents of like, do you know that? Isn't that amazing? I've never actually heard someone be amazed by that. It's all true, by the way. If we could see them, our air would be choked thick with all the different waves. But nobody sits around in awe thinking about all of that and how it makes them feel because we don't feel it. And so we aren't moved by what we don't see, but we are moved by what we do see. And that's why Jesus came to reveal God to us. You can think of God in a very distant way. I don't really see him. I don't really feel him. I don't really see him at work, but I know there's a God and that's good with me. And Jesus came to drive that deeper for us so we could experience God in a new way. And we respond to God and to the extent that we grasp his love. And we talked about all of this last week. And it's, and it's so important to grasp his love because if we only think of him theologically, it often doesn't move us. Unless you're maybe one of the, these theological nerds, and I tend to be that way a little bit, when I learn theological truths about God, it wakens something within me. You might be like that too, but most of us are when we actually connect with him. So we talked about, about eternal life uh, last week and how we lived that to the fullest. This week, we're going to take a look at another term. Eternal life was a term which was called life from above or life to the fullest. And this week, we're going to look at a different term. And it says here about Jesus that he went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And he did that because he was compassionate and he loved us. Now, the term good news, you know this. This is old hat for most of you. The term good news, we sometimes call it the gospel actually has a historical connection. And it's not just an announcement of good news. Hey, do you know there's a sale on at Walmart today? It's not that kind of good news. It's a political message. So when a king, a new king was born, they would have a, a crier or an announcer shout out the gospel or the good news of a new king. There's a new king reigning. There's a new kingdom on the way. Uh, or, or maybe he's got a, a child or, or there's been a big battle that was won. But it tended to be a political type of message or a message about uh, something that affected how they live. And so it wasn't just 
any message of good news. It was the message that was connected to a kingdom. And so Jesus went around preaching this or announcing, like a herald, the good news of a new kingdom. And of course, everyone in Israel was waiting for this new message because the gospel of the kingdom of God, and now in uh, your Bibles, you'll see two different terms or maybe more than two, um, sometimes called the, God, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Literally, it's the kingdom that comes from above. So up above, there's the heavens, and God is up above. And so it's referred to as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. But really, it's the kingdom that comes from above. And so lots of times I've thought that, you know, when the Bible says something about the kingdom of heaven, it's referring to something in the future when we get to heaven. But that's not really the main focus of it. It's talking about this kingdom uh, that comes from God. And historically in Israel, there was always this sense that we used to be a great kingdom and we hope to be a great kingdom again. And they would think back to the time of David because when David was there and when Solomon was there, everything was right. And so if you asked someone what the kingdom of God would be, chances are in the days of Jesus, they would say something like this. Well, a king from the line of David will arise and set up a new kingdom or a new dynasty, fully, which is fully pleasing to God, and Israel will become the center point of God's blessing. It was a political message. Now, Israel used to be a great kingdom, and, I, and, and during the time of the exile, where they're all captured and taken off to Assyria. When they were in Assyria and in Babylon, they were thinking, oh, we long for that new kingdom when God will make everything right. And when the Assyrians were conquered by the Persians, oh, maybe God will deliver us with this great king. And that wasn't the case. And then Alexander the Great came through and conquered everything. You know, they're still longing for this great kingdom. And the Seleucid kingdom kind of controlled everything during the time of the Maccabean revolt. Some of you who are history buffs think about this kind of thing. And all during this time, people are longing for that kingdom. Oh, we long for the anointed one to come and usher in this great kingdom, but it wasn't happening. And then the Romans came through and control everything. <sighs> it, you get out of breath when you think of everyone controlling everything except where is this new kingdom and so one day the hope is that god will rise up that anointed one and they started call him calling him the messiah and the anointed one translated into the common language of the day was called the christ the anointed one and so they are waiting for someone to deliver them from all these enemies and set up his own kingdom. Israel will be strong. Israel will be powerful. Israel will be the center of God's blessing, and we will be amazing. It's like they were wearing a hat, like this. Let's make Israel great again. Some of you get it, right? Yeah. But it was a, they would see it as a very political thing. We have been downtrodden for so long, we're waiting for that one who will make us great again. And then Jesus comes along and starts preaching and proclaiming that kingdom is here. In fact, John the Baptist came along first. He says, the kingdom is near. And Jesus says, the kingdom is now here. Here I am. And the kingdom has started, this new kingdom except it's a kingdom like they were not expecting. You know, they were expecting a conqueror, someone who's strong and powerful, someone who could put everyone in their place, probably someone who's good with a sword, probably someone who's very good with an army, who can have a lot of influence and power. But Jesus preaches a different kind of kingdom. 
and we call it the upside down kingdom. Sometimes you've heard this term. It's, it's actually not a biblical term, but it's a description of what we see in the Bible. And, and it's described in this, that the first are last and the last will become first. And you go, yeah, but where's the power? Where's the sword, the army? Where's us rising to the top? But Jesus is speaking of a very different kind of kingdom, something that he calls the kingdom of God that is very different and very opposite. And he's saying things like, if you want to be first, you have to choose to be last. You go, wait a minute, I wanted to be first. I didn't want to be last. But Jesus talks about a kingdom where the message is that if you want to be first, you need to choose to be last. If you want to have and you want to gather and you want to be something, you have to give it away. If you want to have power and authority and lead and have influence, you do it by serving. If you really want true joy, it comes through suffering. And even though suffering feels like the end, the suffering leads to joy. And if you want to keep your life, you must lose it. And, and, and we see Jesus practicing all these things and going to the cross. He was choosing life for us, and he did it through death. And if you want to be exalted, you need to humble yourself. And there's this complete opposites. While within us, we want what's on the left-hand side, right? You, it's okay to shake your head. Nobody's going to judge you. Yeah, we want what's on the, I want what's on the left-hand side. I, I, I want to have some things. I, I, I want to have influence, I, you know, some kind of influence and leadership there. I want to experience some joy. I want some life. Uh, you know, being exalted, that sounds a little uppity, but, you know, it'd be nice to be respected, right? But the way to those things is not trying to assert them ourselves but by the opposite, asserting the opposite. And Jesus is bringing this kind of kingdom. And you could see all of these things in Jesus' life. Not only was he preaching it, but he was living it. And you can see that he was giving of himself. And the way he led his disciples was by serving him. And oftentimes in the Holy Week, uh, uh, right before Easter, we might have a foot washing service. And that signifies I'm here to serve. I'm here to be lower than others. I'm to give of myself. And that's the symbolism that comes with it. Uh, and, and Jesus went through times of suffering that he could experience true joy by having us and, and him overcoming evil. And we see all these things in Jesus' life, and he reveals the Father to us by doing these things. And you go, what kind of a kingdom is that? What kind of a kingdom is one that's on the right-hand side? That seems pretty weak, doesn't it? How can a kingdom like that overcome the world? It seems like the world would easily overcome all of that. But history tells us that Jesus started that kingdom and it has been influential and growing ever since. You know, there's some things that Jesus talked about, about the kingdom of God. He invites all, especially the lowly, to be part of that kingdom, which is amazing because in the history and in the time, the people who are really part of the kingdom were those who were elite, those who were powerful, those who were rich, those who were educated, those who could gather an army. That's where power comes from. And those are the kind of people that are usually invited to be part of a kingdom. Some of you have read in the gospel 
the Sermon of the Mount. Does that sound familiar, the Sermon of the Mount? Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And, and, and Matthew chapter 5 starts off with what we call the Beatitudes, right? You, sh shake your head if that kind of sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, the Beatitudes. Now, the word Beatitude is actually the Latin word for blessing. So it's talking about these are the blessings that are handed out, or you could say that Jesus invites us to be part of. Now, some of us preachers have used the Beatitudes in different ways. And you've maybe heard the term, well, the Beatitudes are the attitudes that we should be, right? We should aspire to. So they're the be attitudes, right? You've likely heard things like that. And that kind of works for some of the Beatitudes, but there's some that it doesn't really fit for, that I should strive to be, well, should I strive to mourn? Well, mourning comes from loss, and, well, that's a lament. You know, and lamenting has value, but it's because of loss. What is Jesus really saying here? But for us to think of the Beatitudes as an invitation so when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, it's like he's inviting. He says, you, you over there, you feel like you're poor in spirit? Now, I've got an invitation to you. Come be part of the kingdom of heaven. There's a blessing for you to be had. And those of you who mourn, I've got something for you too. You can be comforted. For those of you who are meek, you know, who hold back, not really so assured, huh. you're going to inherit the earth. And he's offering blessings to, to you for whoever you might be. And the Beatitudes are really a list of blessings that Jesus wants to hand out to us to be part of his kingdom. And as you read through, those who are lowly, those who are meek, those who hunger for thirst and righteousness, and often at their own expense, uh, those who are merciful. Have you ever met a merciful person? They kind of get taken advantage of, right? Yeah. But God says, yeah, the blessing for you is you're going to be shown mercy. Oh, wouldn't that be great that God would show us that kind of mercy? And, he go, and, and you go through the list, and God hand, is offering these blessings. But really, it's an invitation to everyone especially those who might be left out of the thought of the kingdom. But he says, you must enter like little children. Eunice read the passage of scripture today about the little children. And, and we've all, we often think, so what exactly does that mean to enter like a child? Does it mean simple faith? Does it mean you know, fully trusting? You know, it, it probably as you contemplate it, God's spirit can speak into your heart as to, you know, what he's calling you to be. But Jesus says you enter it like a little child. You don't enter it like a conquering king. You don't enter it like someone who's important. You don't enter it like you know everything, but you enter it like a child. He says, it, but it's very different, difficult for the prosperous or the wealthy person to enter the kingdom. And, and we all strive to be prosperous, don't we? We all strive to be self-sufficient. I'm looking after myself. I've got enough money. I'm, you know, I'm easing my worries with my money, right? But it makes it more difficult for us to both enter the kingdom and really participate in the kingdom when we can trust in our finances. But he tells us that we need to deny ourselves and follow Christ. Difficult statements, aren't they? I find these statements really challenging. And, and even to live in the kingdom as a child of God, I realize you know, that list I showed you before and this and going, Jesus is really calling me to something opposite of what I want. But it's by making 
ourselves humble, that he raises us up by sacrifice and of giving that we find true joy and life. And he's calling us to that because that's exactly what Jesus did. Now, there's some things that Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like. And you can find these in Matthew 13 and in Matthew 18. And if you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you'll find a whole lot more of them. But in these two chapters, there's quite a few. And these are meant to be stirrers of our imagination, okay? It, it, it's meant to be fertilizer in our imagination so that we can think of what is it Jesus is meaning. So he says the kingdom of God is like a treasure that's hidden in a field, and when a man discovers it, he quick hides it again, and then he sells everything he has to get enough money to buy that field. Now, some of you are thinking, wait, wait a minute, that's not really right, is it? You know, to, to buy something that someone doesn't, else doesn't know what they have. But the point of it is that it's so valuable to this person, this is what Jesus is trying to say, that they sell everything in order to get it. The kingdom of God is like that. And you go, hmm, what does that mean for me? And Jesus says this, it's like a mustard seed, which is extremely small, but it grows big to become a huge tree that all kinds of birds and animals find a home in it. Hmm. I wonder what that means. Could it be? And, but these are meant to be pondered, to be thought about, to be contemplated, to be meditated upon. And he says, it's like yeast that spreads throughout a whole dough. You use just a little bit of yeast, and you work it in, and you work it in, and it has impact over that whole batch of dough. It's like spreading seeds on different kinds of soil hard soil on the pathway, on soil that's really thin, on soil that's good but covered with weeds, and, and on really productive soil. And it has different impacts on all four of those. And that sounds familiar to some of you, I'm sure. What does that mean? And he says, it's like a king who wants to settle his accounts and he calls everybody in and this man comes in who owes so much, but he can't pay it. And he asks for mercy, and the king grants him mercy and writes off his debt. And then that man, as he leaves the king's throne room, comes across someone who owes him a small amount of money, like 20 bucks. He says, pay me or else I'll foreclose on you. And the king sees this, and he says, I showed you so much mercy and forgiveness, but you're not showing it? Forget it. The deal's off. We're not going there. You owe me all that money now. And you go, whoa. That's a kind of a disturbing picture, isn't it? Like the first part of the picture is really cool. The last part of the picture is kind of tough. But these are pictures of God's kingdom, the kingdom from above. And they are meant to be reflected on. They are meant to be pondered. And when Jesus uses pictures, the picture is meant to go into our mind and to stay in our mind. And we think about that picture. Oh, hmm, what can I learn from that picture? Because he's meant to reveal the character of God through these pictures. So, Oh, and one, one final one, the owner of the vineyard. This one's the craziest of all. You know, if you're a businessman or you hire people, you hate this one. You know, the owner of the vineyard goes out six in the morning, nine in the morning, noon, three in the afternoon, and at five in the afternoon, right before closing at six, okay? And he promises each one, you come and work for me and I'm gonna give you I'm going to pay you generously this day. And he gives them the amount. And it's all the same. And, it, and the idea is that it's meant to portray the generosity of God. It's not about 
you know, how to do business, but it's about the generosity of God because it reveals the Father. And in the kingdom of God, it's all about God's character. What can we learn about him? So as we reflect upon it, a couple things I encourage you to reflect on. First, you are invited to be part of this kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom. It doesn't work the way things work in society today. It's not about power or influence or wealth. It's not about acquiring and amassing political power. It's not about any of those things, but it's about serving, about giving, about forgiving. It's all about the things. It's like the opposite of what we naturally want. But by trusting Christ in that opposite, we actually get what we long for. He's inviting us. He invites the woman who was unfaithful to her husband, cheated on him, and everybody wanted to stone her. And Christ says, where are your accusers? Uh, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. He invites those who are physically in need. Those who are blind, those who are deaf, those who are lame, those who can't make it in a society that in those days had no welfare. He invites all that come, be part of this kingdom. He invites you to be part of his kingdom. Whether you're more mature, maybe you're younger, maybe you've had a checkered lifestyle, maybe you're living in a situation that people question about you, whether you've got fear or whether you're courageous, whatever your situation is, God is inviting you and he's saying, come be part of my kingdom. Come be part of my Father. Come be part of us. I encourage you, take some time this week to explore how Jesus lived out that list of things that he talked about in the kingdom. And you can see it in Philippians chapter 2. And just take some time and read that passage of Scripture, Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11, and explore how did Jesus live out the upside-down kingdom. And third, how would you like to develop as a resident of God's kingdom? And you might say, oh, I'm a resident already. I've been a resident of God's kingdom for all. Yes, but how would you like to develop? And remember that list that we showed you? Pick one of these. Pick one of these that really connects with you. You might say, hmm, I really want life. So how can I die to myself so that I can have life? Or some of you might say, I really want to acquire some stuff. I really want to have, you know, I, I, I need to have, I need more. I can't sustain myself the way it is now. I need more. So how do I give? How can I be generous? How can I look after the needs of others. So pick one of these that connects with where you are right now. You say, there's one I need to explore. You see them? Pick one. You say, this week I want to explore that. I want to think about it. I want to encourage you in that way. You're invited to be part of the kingdom. Explore how Jesus did it and see how you can grow in the kingdom. And as we come up to Easter, and a time when Jesus truly reveals who God is, we can appreciate that. We can appreciate him and enter into it completely. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kingdom that Jesus initiated and that will one day come to fruition 
fully. And Heavenly Father, we want to be part of your kingdom. Give us faith, Lord, to be part of it. Give us the faith to choose to serve, to choose to give, and to trust you with all other things. And that if we seek first the kingdom of God, then all the other things will be added. Give us faith, Lord, to live as Jesus lived his life. We ask in his name. Amen.